For an update, Margaret Warner talked earlier this evening with correspondent Abigail Fielding Smith of the Financial Times in Beirut. Abigail Fielding Smith, thank you for joining us. There are reports tonight that the Assad government has launched yet another assault on Hama in the evening, the, the fiercest one yet. Why would the government be going after Hama now after a whole summer in which the city has been basically free of government control? Well, uh, it's the start of Ramadan, and uh, protesters across the country have threatened to escalate protests during Ramadan. They've said that every day will be like Friday and Ramadan. So I think they wanted to send a clear message. Uh, they've always had slightly mixed feelings about Hama. On the one hand, there were very large protests there, um, which obviously they didn't like. But on the other hand, there was a huge massacre there in 1982 when over 10,000 people were killed. And the regime are thought to be wary of evoking those memories. So uh, they, I feel like they didn't quite know what to do. Uh, but now they've sent a clear signal that this is a message, not just to Hama, but I think to the whole protest movement. Um, you know, don't, don't think about escalating things in Ramadan. And how are the demonstrators resisting? What do they have to resist with? Well, I mean, in Hama, uh, one activist told me all they have really is, is sticks and stones, literally. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing very much they can do up against uh, armored vehicles and, and machine guns. Um, there are reports in somewhere like Deir Azur in the east where they have slightly easier access to weapons that there have been some shooting back, but not really on a, on a very large scale that, that I've heard of. Um, overwhelmingly, this is a peaceful protest movement. That's what all the kind of uh, analysts that I speak to and people on the ground say. Um, and the protest organizers are, are very keen to keep it that way. This is the first uh, day, as you said, of the holy month of Ramadan. What sense do you get about whether the people of Syria are responding to this call to escalate the demonstrations? Well, I think, you know, even if there hadn't been a call uh, prior to the events of the last two days, uh, people are very angry at what's happened, not just in Hama, but also in Deir Azur in the east. Uh, and elsewhere in Syria, um, and particularly that it's happening now during the holy month. Um, I think people are very angry, and, and whenever I speak to activists, they say that they're defiant, that people are not going to be scared and, and cowed uh, into their houses. Uh, on the other hand, um, you know, it's clear that the regime are prepared to use a significant level of force. And the protest leaders hope that during Ramadan, when people gather, at dusk to break the fast at the mosques, that that will help generate bigger protests, more frequent ones? Well, yes. Uh, prayer time has been a, a traditional time when, when protests have, have really sort of started in earnest in Syria because it's an occasion where people gather. And so obviously in Ramadan, you have more of those occasions. You have them every day. Uh, but also, someone I was talking to today said, uh, it's also the kind of the spirit of Ramadan, which is one with spiritual time when, when people think about, you know, what's important to them and what they want to achieve. One of the cities where the, the activists have urged people to join in is Damascus, the capital. What are they doing to counter? What is, what else is the, gov what is the government doing to counter that possibility? Well, one of the things that they've been quite keen to do is, is to clamp down on protest in the suburbs around Damascus. There haven't really been large protests in Damascus itself, not just because of security presence, but also because I think the atmosphere is different in Damascus. There's a lot more people there who have a stake in the system, who, who support the president even. Uh, but there is a different mood in the suburbs, and the suburbs have been seeking to kind of build momentum and, and you know, take it into the capital. And there has been a big crackdown in the suburbs. As you pointed out yesterday, we also saw government assaults in other cities around the country. Does the government have enough loyal forces to actually maintain that kind of presence, that kind of pressure all throughout the country? Well, I mean, it's it, it's difficult to talk about the exact capacities of the of the Syrian, Syrian military. It's not terribly transparent. Um, certainly, you know, they've got a large conscript army, but as you say, the, their loyalty is in question. Most analysts of the military that I've spoken to seem to think that, uh, you know, they're able to sustain the kind of 
uh, deployments that they've done up until now. But if they start having to deploy in different cities across the country simultaneously, possibly we, we might see them start to be stretched. Now, today the EU slightly expanded its sanctions against Syria. The Security Council is going behind closed doors at the UN, I think, even as we speak. How is Syria withstanding the economic pressure? How much is Syria feeling it? Well, anecdotally, there's a lot of pressure on the Syrian pound. Uh, people obviously are worried, don't have confidence in the currency. There have been reports of people taking their money out of the country. Uh, so, and obviously they've lost tourism, which was a huge source of, of foreign currency for them. So that pressure is being felt. Um, I don't think the latest round of EU sanctions will do that much to, to add to that. Finally, of course, I know you are in touch with the activist circles. How are they holding up under all this pressure from the government? Well, I'm always amazed at, at at their morale and, and the, the, the worse things happen and, and the more things go on, uh, the more they seem to be determined uh, and, and, you know, they don't seem to be being cowed. But having said that, there's no doubt that things are very difficult for them. It's very difficult for them to, uh, to meet up with, with each other, to discuss strategy um, and, you know, to pass on and share information. Uh, so uh, I think the ones that I've spoken to, their, their spirit is, is still very strong and, and, if anything, being strengthened by these crackdowns. Um, but obviously they do have an effect uh, and um, I don't think anyone thinks it's going to be an easy struggle. Well, Abigail Fielding-Smith from the Financial Times, thank you. Thank you.